Hey there, folks. Today, I am so excited to let you know about a new single from Missy Rains and Allegheny, which I played on, called Fast Moving Train, which you can listen to right now on all major streaming services. And in this video, I wanna tell you all about this song, the recording process. I'll show you a bunch of the stuff that I played on this track, even tell you about the banjo that I used to record the track with. But first, do me a huge favor and just go listen to the song. There's a link in the description of this video where you can check it out on any streaming service. Feel free to listen to it, share it with friends, put it on playlists. All that stuff is super helpful for anyone recording music right now. Now, the song is called Fast Moving Train. It's the second single we've put out that's going to be on this upcoming record, which you can listen to in February of 2024. And it's one of my favorites that we recorded. It's pretty banjo heavy, so that probably has something to do with it. But it's loud, it's fast, there's a lot of energy, so it's just a fun one to do live and it's a lot of fun to record as well. And it was written by Shad Cobb, who's a great fiddle player, singer, songwriter. You actually might remember him from our earlier single, These Old Blues. He was one of the three fiddle players on that track as well. So it was great to be able to play and record with him, but it's also just great to play some of his great songs. This is actually one of two songs that Shad wrote that we're putting on this album. But if you're watching this video right now on my YouTube channel, then there is a pretty decent chance that you're a banjo player. So let's get into some of the banjo nerd stuff. I recorded this track and about half of the album with this banjo, which is a 1930s Gibson TB11 conversion. And if you don't really know what that means, basically this used to be a tenor banjo, a four string banjo. And generally what people will do is take these four string banjos and have five string necks made for them so that you could play them in this style. And in the case of this banjo, it has a neck made by Frank Neat, which is made of mahogany and it's also got an aftermarket more modern tone ring added to it made by Blaylock and it's a no hole tone ring. And obviously things like the bridge and the head and the strings are all modern but otherwise the rest of it is from the 1930s made by Gibson. It's a banjo that I've had for a long time. I've played it a lot and I really love it. It has a great traditional bluegrass sound which is really great for this track and a lot of the things on this album. I don't play it live too much. It doesn't seem to work best for everything that we do but in this case I think it was kind of the right banjo to choose for this kind of sound. As for the song itself, this is one that we've been playing for over a year. So when we got in the studio, there was some of this stuff that I'd been playing for a long time, but then there's also some stuff we added to this track that we came up with on the spot in the studio. So hopefully I can show you some of that as well. And there's a couple things that kind of stand out about this song and make it special. I mean, first of all, it's really fast. It's kind of chaotic, which I love that about it, but it's also got some interesting chord changes. So let's just get into the music theory of this song a little bit. So we're in the key of B flat, where you might expect to see chords like B flat. E flat, F, maybe a G minor. That's our one, four, five, and six minor in that key. But instead of that six minor, we have six major. That's a G major chord. Now it sounds very interesting, but technically it's not in the key of B flat. And these days that's just kind of unusual, not unheard of, but unusual. That said, if you listen to old time music or some early bluegrass, you'll hear it a lot more often, the six major chord instead of minor. And for banjo players, that can be a little bit of an issue. So go ahead and take a listen to some of the ideas that I would play over the verse of this song. So for a lot of that verse, I'm really just thinking standard Scruggs material. And then I'm just thinking slightly differently when I get to that six major chord. And here's why. If you notice, when I play this chord, this note here, this third, which is the difference between this minor chord and a major chord, clashes with my fifth string. 
And you might think that that's kind of a problem, or at least something that you should avoid. And in certain contexts, I'm sure that you would want to avoid that. But the nice thing with this song is that's actually kind of the sound that we're going for. The song is really fast and loud and chaotic, and that just actually adds to the chaos. And there's also an extent to which, when we're playing that major chord, we want kind of the major and minor happening at the same time. That comes in really strong later in the song, but for now, just trust me that that's really kind of the sound that we're going for. So if you go back and listen to what I was playing on the verse, you'll notice that I'm not really spending a whole lot of time sitting here with that interval happening, but I'm not shying away from the fifth string either. And it's worth mentioning that a lot of the times when your fifth string is clashing with the chord that you're playing, unless it is really too prominent in getting in the way of the sound of the song, it's going by fast enough that it really doesn't matter. The fifth string is not really the most important thing that's happening with what you're playing. It's the drone string. So it's often just kind of there in the background. So not always, but sometimes you can just play it and not really think about how well it clashes or fits with the chord that you're playing. Obviously that is just up to taste, so you really have to listen to what you're playing and see if it fits. You can't just assume that it's gonna be fine, but in this case, I actually think it works really well. By the way, folks, if you want tablature for all the examples in this video and all of my videos, you can get that at patreon.com slash Eli Gilbert Banjo. Patreon is where I put the tablature for all of my videos, as well as bonus content like backup examples, practice tips, that sort of thing. And it's just a great way to support these videos as well. But anyway, back to the lesson. And that's how I handle playing backup down the neck, but I'm also playing some up the neck backup too. So here's what I play over the first half of the second verse. Take me across the great diva. Take me to the other side. Don't care where, I just gotta go. So once again, pretty classic Scrug style material for this, this time up the neck. And then when I get to the sixth major chord, I just have to account for the fact that I'm playing a major chord instead of a minor chord, which I would usually play. And that can be kind of tricky up the neck, especially with a capo, if you're doing anything other than what is most conventional. And that sixth major chord isn't exactly conventional. And I don't spend a ton of time playing a sixth major chord with my capo on the third fret up the neck. So that's something worth practicing. But there's kind of a trick for this, which is that when I'm in the key of B flat, my sixth major chord is G major. So even though when I'm down here, down the neck, closer to the capo, I'm thinking really more of this E major shape. Once I get up the neck, I'm actually just still thinking about G. So I'm kind of ignoring the capo for a moment and just doing what I do most of the time, which is play at a G position with no capo. So all of my normal G shapes apply here, and that's what I would practice. And now let's move on to some of the solos. There's actually three different solo or banjo feature sections, starting with a solo after the first chorus. So for this one, I try to keep it as simple as possible and mostly just focus on the melody, which is especially true when I got to that sixth major chord. That melody note is G, and I wanted to just mostly roll on that note. So actually what I end up playing is really basically just the Foggy Mountain Breakdown lick up two frets. And I did that because if I had played a full chord shape there, it actually becomes too hard to focus on the melody note. Sometimes this note sticks out, Sometimes it's the... 
It's the dissonance between all of those notes. So I knew that if I just had that one note, the note that really mattered, and then just classic roll patterns, that that would actually shine through and be the main event of what I was playing. And part of the reason I thought it was so important to just keep it simple and focus on the melody is because this is actually the first solo. There's obviously kind of a bass fiddle kickoff that happens, but this is the first solo after the verse and chorus. So that's always a good time to just focus on the melody. Plus things get a little more chaotic and interesting later in the song, so no need to do that at all times. For instance, later in the song, I share a solo with our mandolin player Tristan Scroggins, which goes like this. This is one of the sections that went through a lot of changes in the studio. We knew that we wanted to have a lot of energy coming out of the gate, coming out of the mandolin solo, but then we also needed to be able to build up even more energy leading towards a chorus. So how do you do that? I mean, I came in playing just about as loud and as hard as I could, so how do you then build more energy after that? Well, as we were working this out, I was a little bit at a loss for what to play. I mean, there's kind of unlimited options. There's plenty of things one could play, but how do you know what feels right? It was totally by accident as we were recording this. I had a little time off while someone else was recording a solo, and I was scrolling through YouTube just looking for other banjo players, other bands, trying to get some inspiration for something that could go in that space. And I just happened to come across a video of a great banjo player and teacher, John Mark Batchelor, and he played this lick. And it somehow just kind of perfectly fit in this space where I was supposed to be leading back into the chorus. And it's great because I could play loud at the beginning of the solo and have a lot of energy. And then the way it builds up to the chorus is just by the fact that it has this melody that leads all the way up to the four chord where we start on the chorus. And even though I just kind of happened to stumble across that video, it's a pretty important lesson that when it comes to the arrangement of a song, dynamics, building up to a next section, there are a lot of different ways to do that. And it's a lot more nuanced and subtle than just playing louder or quieter. So that's something I've actually been thinking about a lot more lately. And beyond that, do me a huge favor and go check out John Mark Batchelor. That's where I learned this lick. I'll leave a link in the description where you can check out his YouTube channel. He's got a bunch of great videos. He's been one of my favorite players for a long time. He's got some great records that he's played on. His videos are great, so please go check that out. Anyway, moving on, the final banjo solo, banjo feature section comes at the very end of the song. Sounds like this. Now, hopefully while listening to that, you noticed a couple similarities between that and Foggy Mountain Breakdown, and that is totally intentional. Remember before when I talked about this kind of combination of major and minor when we play that sixth chord, that I'm often playing this major chord, but also the fifth string, and there's that dissonance there. And that's really what we're playing off of in this section. The rest of the band is just playing the one chord in the sixth major. That's B flat and G major. But you'll notice when I go to that G chord, I'm now playing a minor chord. I'm playing G minor. So we're playing two totally different chords, G major and G minor. And the inspiration for this came from Foggy Mountain Breakdown. If you go back and listen to the original recording from 1949, you'll hear that Earl Scruggs is playing G, E minor, and D. Those are the chords that he's playing. That's what the melody is based off of. But you will also hear Lester Flatt, who's playing guitar on that recording, playing G, E major, and D. E major and E minor 
obviously clash in that respect, but it's that sound that made that recording so special. If you go listen to it, there's something about it that just isn't quite right. It's not exactly E major, it's not exactly E minor. It's both at the same time. And it's a little unclear how intentional that was in that original recording. Some people will say it was completely unintentional, but it's a sound that we're all familiar with now. And if you hear some people play Foggy Mountain Breakdown, oftentimes the guitar player, sometimes as a joke, will play an E major chord instead of E minor. I think it actually sounds pretty cool. It's very dissonant and kind of chaotic, but it's a cool sound. And that's what was really great about recording this track is that we had the time, but also we're open-minded enough to try these things. You know, we tried a couple different versions of a lot of things in this arrangement, and it wasn't until we settled on these things that it felt like it was right. And for that, I have to give a lot of credit to our producer, Allison Brown, who you probably already know is a phenomenal banjo player in her own right, but also a great producer. And it was really great to have her input on all this stuff and really great for her to give us space to try things on our own and then all come together and decide what we we're gonna do. It was very collaborative and I think we came up with something a lot more special because of that connection. Anyway, folks, I hope you found that interesting, maybe even a little educational, but for now, go ahead and do me a favor and go check out this song, listen to it wherever you stream music. But otherwise, I'm gonna get back to practicing some of this stuff so I can actually play it live. Feel free to check out Patreon, subscribe to this channel, like this video, all of that stuff. But otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.